Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Nuno Gomez from Porto, Portugal. He completed his general internship in Porto and Macau, China, and his orthopedic residency in Porto as an army doctor in 2006, which included several fellowships in France and Spain. He maintains since then his public and private practice in the Porto region in Portugal, and it includes his role as a clinical director of orthopedics department of the Armed Forces Hospital in Porto, and with special dedication to shoulder surgery for almost 17 years. He's currently the vice chairman of the European Shoulder Associates of ESCA, and is a frequent contributor to international training events and conferences. Today, it's my great honor to bring back Dr. Nono Gomez from Porto Porsche. Porto, no, no. Thank you, Hitesh, for that uh, introduction and the kind invitation. It's uh, my second turn here, and uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, contribute in uh, whatever I can. So I'm going to uh, share some words on uh, this uh, controversial topic, the first time shoulder dislocations, whether you should uh, go for surgery right away, what to do in these kind of uh, situations. Um, so what do we have here? Now, what do you think this is? This is just a plain plastic bag, you would say. And in fact, it is. But this is uh, exactly or uh, quite similar to what uh, actually happens to a shoulder every time it dislocates. It's this plastic deformation uh, that, uh, that um, comes with every dislocation and does not come back. So uh, many authors have tried to uh, or have uh, actually studied the, the natural history of uh, shoulder dislocations and uh, there are several evidences concerning that. Uh, these authors found, as uh, everyone would uh, know, that uh, the rate of recurrence uh, varies in an opposite direction to that of age and uh, surgery will likely diminish that rate. And there are also some um, uh, unavoidable truths uh, that these authors also shared. And we also know, of course, after a few years in orthopedics that adolescents with high sports demand have an unacceptable recurrence rate and uh, half of those between 20 and 25 years will not re-dislocate. And this is important to know. And therefore, many authors have tried to define several criteria um, to decide whether to go to surgery or not. And those would be uh, younger age, uh, top sportsmen into contact or overhead sports like active military, and I deal with those uh, quite a lot. Then uh, bankrupt lesions present in uh, the imaging workup, uh, which is uh, uh, quite obvious, I would say. And besides that, uh, absence of hyperlaxity, considering that's uh, um, a risk for failure. So you should also consider that when uh, trying to decide what to do to these patients. So is immobilization uh, a solution after the first episode? Some would say that uh, it's probably unnecessary. I would say that uh, I wouldn't really know, but uh, I have the perception that uh, it's probably useful after the first episode, but one must decide which type of uh, immobilization. Several reports and several evidences would say, like this one from Avilius from a long time ago, that uh, immobilizing uh, in internal rotation or no immobilization is exactly the same. So evidences push us towards, uh, towards this. However, uh, a couple of decades ago, Etoy in cadaveric studies uh, came up with this, uh, with this concept of immobilizing in external rotation. And it does make sense, I believe. They showed, or he showed and his team and uh, other teams show that whenever immobilization is done in external rotation and uh, uh, a slight abduction, the apposition of the labrum, the anterior labrum, due to the tension to the anterior structures, that apposition is much more anatomical when uh, immobilized than when immobilized in internal rotation. So conceptually, it does make sense. Uh, they showed in a couple of series that the rate of recurrences could be as low as zero percent uh, when compared to 30 percent after immobilization in internal rotation. So uh, this is significant. Later on, 
again, another series showing 26% uh, of recurrences uh, versus 42% uh, when immobilizing internal rotation with, uh, with a risk reduction of 46% uh, when we're talking about patients below age 30. However, other authors uh, didn't conclude the same. So one must um, bear in mind that uh, maybe some of these reports uh, can be biased. Many of them that were out and published were uh, published by Etoy's team, but still it's uh, important information. So is it useful? Uh, isn't it useful? Apparently there are contradictory evidences like uh, uh, this one on the right that says it doesn't uh, uh, offer anything positive to, to, to do the, the demobilization external rotation. But one also must have bear in mind, why are so many differences uh, between these reports? It's known that compliance uh, for using external rotation immobilization is an issue. And so I brought the, the, this uh, clinical case of mine, and uh, I must say that uh, I tried in several patients, mainly from the military, this kind of immobilization, and I had the perception that uh, it does make sense, especially in those cases where the patients are not willing at all to be operated on. This is an 18-year-old year old male that uh, suffered his first dislocation doing bodyboard. The x-ray just, just showed a, a small and uh, not very deep heel sacs lesion. The glenoid was okay, so no major bony lesion on the glenoid side. And he was immobilized in external rotation after reduction uh, in, the, in the emergency room right away. And uh, he was kept like that for three weeks. And I have the perception uh, since then that uh, uh, one important factor is being able to immobilize them, not exactly in external rotation, but in neutral rotation, because it's not so uncomfortable. Uh, they should be immobilized right away, like in the first couple of days. Otherwise, you will have this hematoma um, impairing the air position of the labrum against, uh, against uh, the bone. So do it right away if you can. So have the immobilizers ready in the ER. That's what I had by then. And then rehab for, for some time for proprioception, uh, strengthening. And after two months, uh, an MRI as a control showed a regular and attached, uh, apparently scarred labrum in its natural position uh, with integrity of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, as you can uh, uh, imagine from here, namely, with a small heel sacs. And uh, physical examination at four and nine months, and later on, after one year, he had no redislocation, no instability, no hyperlaxity. He had no complaints, was back to sports with no problems. Obviously, these are uh, like this one. I had other cases, just anecdotal, so I never uh, statistically uh, deal with the data. But this is the personal perception I had from uh, dealing with these cases. So further studies were needed and were are still out today, trying to compare conservative option and surgical option after primary dislocations. This is a very interesting and large uh, study from Hovilius from uh, uh, some uh, time ago, from uh, 10 years ago or so, uh, with uh, 25 years of follow-up. He studied uh, patients uh, after first dislocation treated conservatively. And uh, he noticed that half of those below age 25 did not recur or became stable. Meaning that if all those were operated on, between 30 to 50% of uh, the surgeries would have been unnecessary. However, we have reports uh, stating clearly there's an increased tendency to indicate surgery uh, in the last few years. Just like this one, this study from uh, eight years ago showing a dramatic evolution of practice uh, in our orthopedic world. In seven years, uh, the number of surgeries after primary uh, dislocations doubled uh, with a massive appeal for arthroscopy, which is uh, uh, quite understandable. We like arthroscopy, we like operating on. Something new comes and uh, we're all willing to uh, try it. Uh, believing it's going to offer uh, best results. And there's a special subset of, uh, of patients 
that um, uh, may uh, may uh, uh, be looked at in a different way. And those are uh, in-season athletes. Uh, this nice study show that uh, immobilizing may be a good option even in contact athletes when uh, they're in season, especially due to uh, to the short absence from sports. However, they also showed in this this report that more than one third had at least one additional episode of this location with uh, all the negative uh, things that come along, like more lesions and uh, and uh, more aggressiveness of uh, of, uh, of the lesions. And 12 of those patients required a later surgery. This is also important because uh, whenever you do it later on, you uh, don't really have, just like you see in this video, simpler and cleaner uh, um, uh, lesions to uh, to address. So things will get more complicated and uh, it's known and it's been shown that uh, the success rate is lower whenever you take longer to go for surgery. And this is the only report I found comparing the, the, the lesions arising from uh, one dislocation or when compared to uh, multiple dislocations. Uh, these authors show that the Alps lesion is uh, typical of uh, multiple dislocations. So uh, this has to be uh, taken in, in, into consideration as well. And whenever you have these Alps lesions, when compared to simple bunk art uh, uh, detachments, um, the outcomes are lower uh, when operated. They also found that in those patients below 22, and whenever there was a delay in surgery over six months, the rate of recurrence had increased. So just don't leave it for later on. So what would the indications for in-season surgery be? Uh, these are uh, relative and absolute indications. Uh, again, bear in mind that they're based on lower levels of evidence and experts' opinion alone. Uh, but uh, all absolute indications are uh, quite obvious, I would say, like uh, major bony defects in the glenoid or in the heel sex lesion, uh, calf tears, and so on. But at the end of the day, what really matters and will matter most is the patient or the, the family or the coach's expectations and their will after um, proper counseling from us. So our job, our role is to counsel patients, team, family, and then have the patient decide and uh, accepting or not accepting the risks of uh, one treatment option or the other. Now, this is a, a very uh, interesting and important uh, report, a consensus that was out just a couple of weeks ago. So this is from the last issue of the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery. Uh, this um, group of surgeons from the American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeons uh, group uh, concluded with a, with a high level of agreement that those that should go for surgery are those above 14 years old, contact athletes by the end of the season and um, showing apprehension and with a meaningful bone loss. And then on the other opposite side of the spectrum, of the spectrum um, they would account, they would uh, um, suggest conservative treatment, again, with a very high level of agreement between all the surgeons that participated. Uh, that should be indicated for non-athletes of all ages with no apprehension and no meaningful bone loss. Still, we know that there's a very large gray zone when uh, uh, one has to decide. And for that, consider all these features. These features that strongly influence the decision to perform surgery, those were Having meaningful bone loss that was uh, considered to be 13.5% uh, of the glenoid width, and that was um, decided so, considering that after a first dislocation, it's not that likely that uh, the, the bony lesions will be so large unless you have uh, a fracture, of course, but uh, it's not the typical patient in which you will find bony erosion. And besides that, uh, the presence of apprehension as well. They also stated that age below 14 and age above 30 years old, in those groups, it's less likely to, to, to have an indication, a clear indication for surgery unless major uh, other risk factors are present. And that's considering that uh, olds uh, by 2015 showed that 
those patients below 14 are 24, 24 times less likely to recur than uh, their adolescent uh, counterparts. So at the end, and this is a, a, a scheme or a, a strategy uh, that I, that I uh, use most of the times. Again, this is uh, uh, without uh, major, um, uh, major evidences, but this is uh, in, a, in a grossly matter, in a rough way, what I follow. If I have a patient that's below 25 with major risk factors, being a contact athlete, namely the military, I treat a lot, with major bone loss on the x-ray, then it's likely it's going to uh, need surgery. If he accepts, then I just continue workup, imaging workup, and uh, it's, it's highly likely he will end up with surgery. If that's not the case, or he does not accept uh, going for surgery, and uh, or if he's above 25 years old with no major risk factors, then uh, I'll probably immobilize him in external rotation in case he accepts or in case I'm uh, lucky enough to, or he's lucky enough enough to to, to bump into uh, uh, health to, to to proper care in the first uh, one or two days, and then take him to rehab for a few months and then uh, re-examine him um, again. If he's okay, just leave it. If he's uh, complaining of uh, pain or apprehension, or if he re-dislocates, then imaging exams. Uh, counseling, if he accepts the risks, uh, go for surgery, probably. But at the end, do not forget that surgery may be a very good option. And um, most of the times I tend into uh, uh, suggesting surgery. Uh, surgery does not set aside the recurrence risk. So patients have to be counseled properly before decision. It's not risk-free as uh, it's easily understandable and does not diminish the recovery and uh, uh, absence time. So, and uh, just to end with a uh, reminder, uh, you're all welcome to uh, come to Warsaw by September next year. It's going to be the second edition of the Specialty Days of, uh, of ESCA. Uh, you're welcome. And uh, uh, just uh, to let you know that abstracts have been open, so feel free to uh, apply uh, to, and to send abstracts for uh, submission. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nuno, for that fantastic presentation. Very, very important topic on how to manage a first-time shoulder dislocator. Uh, I think the biggest problem of a brace in an external rotation is compliance, right? I think that is the biggest yeah. issue. Yes, so, it is. It is. Uh, in fact, I've discussed that uh, a lot with uh, with some uh, colleagues of mine in Portugal and uh, all over the place. And uh, uh, I'm not really sure the perception on the actual um, efficacy of this uh, kind of immobilization is, uh, is the best uh, uh, among uh, surgeons. My perception, and uh, I tried this, uh, and I did this uh, treatment in, uh, in, in uh, I would say in some dozens, uh, not a very large number, uh, but in some dozens. And uh, compliance may be an issue, and uh, besides that, it's not comfortable for us as well to, to have that available to offer the patient right away. So what I tried uh, some years ago was having the immobilizer, one uh, for the right shoulder and another one for the left shoulder, uh, available in the ER. And uh, whenever uh, a primary dislocator comes in, he's reduced, and then have the team that's on site having the immobilization uh, ready and available right away. They will immobilize them on day zero and then uh, address the patient uh, to my outpatient clinics and I would follow them afterwards. Now, it's true it's not that comfortable, but uh, some commercial immobilizers are not that uncomfortable. If the patient is willing to, uh, to uh, uh, accept and understand, he may benefit from that. Uh, he will use it. It's not exactly external rotation, you know, it, it's kind of neutral rotation, which is better than nothing, I would say. But it's true that compliance, uh, it's a problem. And uh, being actually able to, to, to put the immobilizer on day one or day two. Thank you for that. 
The other question is, do you always do arthroscopy? Do you have, do you think there's a role for a open bunkard repair? I can quote a trial that was published uh, in JBG's American from a Canadian group which said that open and arthroscopy does not uh, make a difference in outcomes. And even yes. arthroscopy, there was a slightly higher recurrence rate. Uh, well, uh, in my hands, not really, because uh, I'm from uh, an age in which uh, I didn't uh, do many open bank arts. Why is that? Uh, not because I, I was born with arthroscopy, not that. I did, and I still do, many open surgeries. Uh, but uh, in my school, in my home, and uh, my, my chief by some 20 years ago, uh, he was a Latage fan. So most uh, of the surgeries for recurrent dislocators, for me, years ago at the beginning of my practice, were open latages, not open uh, bank cards. So the first bank cards I did uh, were arthroscopic. So for me, there's a uh, latage, either open or arthroscopic. I've done uh, just a few, but then I, I, I didn't find any, any, really, uh, any real advantage in doing it. So I'm, I, I will, I'm back to doing them uh, open or midi open, whatever you want to call it. And then uh, arthroscopic uh, capsule labral repairs. So that's about it, not open bank cards. I think I did once uh, or twice, and I wasn't the main surgeon. I was helping someone in France because that, that was a, a common procedure over there as well. Uh, well, Latage is more common, but still, they, they, they also did by then uh, open bank cards. But I think that was the only occasions I did an open bank card. And uh, what about a scenario where there is a humeral avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament, HAGL lesion, where the avulsion occurs from the humeral side? And in that condition, do you think there's a role for open? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, if you're talking about the reverse haggle, uh, then um, doing it arthroscopically is a very good option. It's not uh, that complicated. It's, it's quite close to doing a rump lissage. Uh, when it's uh, an anterior haggle, uh, namely those large lesions that go inferiorly to the axillary pouch, that's quite complicated to, to do uh, arthroscopically. And uh, I would say that uh, oftentimes um, uh, I would, I would uh, really feel uh, uh, I wouldn't be able to offer the best treatment arthroscopically and uh, I would have no problems in opening it and fixing it open. And in that particular scenario, would you prefer an open bunk card or a lethargy? If I'm able to, uh, to um, identify it beforehand, because sometimes you're in doubt. Some MRIs show it clearly, others not really. Uh, and uh, in that case, you have to be prepared for everything but you may not be prepared for, uh, for a latage. You may not have uh, the instrumentation available if you're uh, operating and started the operation um, expecting to do it arthroscopically. So I would open it and, and fix the, the, the Hagel lesion. But uh, if I knew it beforehand and if other um, risk factors were present, I would definitely go for, for a Latage. Uh, I'm a Latage fan. As, uh, as you said at the beginning, I did uh, many of my, uh, much of my training in France. Uh, so I'm uh, a bit biased, perhaps, but I do believe it's a brilliant surgery with a high rate of success. So when we're talking about uh, soccer players, rugby, rugby players, well, there's no doubt there. Uh, that's Latage, even after a first dislocation and even in youngsters, in adolescents. Many surgeons from, uh, from uh, the US, the UK, in countries where um, it's it's more common to go for bankard repairs, unlike in France or uh, in Portugal, in in some areas of Portugal at least. Um, some for some people in those countries, it's kind of strange to indicate the latage to a 16 year old or 17 year old. Well, listen, I have no problems whatsoever in doing a latage at that age. The the rate of success is high, and we also know. Uh, that the rate of uh, re-dislocation and the rate of, of failure after uh, 
an arthroscopic capsule label fixation at that age is quite high. So you have to balance the pros and cons. And in my opinion, doing a latage in an adolescent is a good option. Thank you, Dr. Gomez, for that. I think even I have done a few lethargies uh, for young patients, and I feel the biggest advantage is the recurrence, lower recurrence rate. Because a second surgery, when you talk about second surgery to a young, young person, he goes literally off his mind. So I think the biggest advantage is the lower recurrence rate with the lethargy, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, yeah, Dr. Gomez. I think. Yeah. Anything more? No, no, no. Okay, I think that's all the questions that we have, Dr. Gomez. Fantastic presentation, and uh, really you. happy to listen to you once again. And uh, we wish you the best for your ESCA meeting next year in Poland. Thank you very Thank much you. for joining. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Take care.